Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 1263 of the Juice Box Podcast. Welcome back. This is part two of a two part episode. If you haven't listened to 1262, do not start listening to this one because it's not going to make any sense. This is part two. Episode 1262 is part one. This is episode 1263, part two of DKA in our town. Nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan. Tickets for the 2025 Juice Cruise are limited. I'm not just saying that. They actually are limited. We have a certain window to sell them in, and then that's it. Juiceboxpodcast.com. Scroll down to the Juice Cruise banner. Click on it. Find a cabin that works for you and register right now. You are absolutely limited by time on this one. I'm so sorry to say that. It sounds pushy, but it's the absolute truth. Juice Cruise 2025. I hope to see you there. We're going to get a tan, talk about diabetes, and meet a ton of great people who are living with diabetes. It's kind of going to be like floating diabetes camp, but you won't have to sleep in a log cabin. You'll get a tan. And it's not just for adults or kids. It's for everybody. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Omnipod 5. Learn more and get started today at omnipod.com slash juice box. Check it out. Today's podcast is sponsored by U.S. Med. usmed.com slash juice box. You can get your diabetes supplies from the same place that we do. And I'm talking about Dexcom, Libre, Omnipod, Tandem, and so much more. usmed.com slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. So anyway, so the next day, um, it's five o'clock in the morning. This is the 31st at this point. Um, we noticed that his right leg was swollen and, you know, we told the nurses, we're like, Hey, his leg looks bigger. Also, we were really concerned because his face was swollen. You could see the tip of his nose was like shiny Hmm. and his eyelids were so swollen that he could barely open his eyes and like the fat, like is, is on the top of his feet were swollen. So it was just like his entire body. And so he told the nurses and, you know, it's five o'clock in the morning and they come in, they end up calling the IV team in and they're looking at it. And, you know, they thought like the IV could be infiltrated. Like we need, you know, this one's blown. Like we need to get potentially something else in him while they're looking at it. The IV team, like one of the girls was like, you know, you need to call the doctor. And so he goes out, calls the doctor comes back in on his little, you know, phone. He's like on the phone with the doctor at that point. And she's like, you better tell him to hurry up and get here. And so like, we're like, what? You know, like, again, like we have no idea what's happening. So doctor comes in, he looks at it. He's like, yeah, definitely needs, you know, new IV. You know, at that point though, this is only like a day after he is resolved from DKA. And you know, he really doesn't have a lot of sites left that they can even really try. So they took him back to that little procedure room to try to get another IV. He's in there for a while again, and they end up getting one in his foot. He mentioned that they were going to try to, like the only ones left were his his scalp. But they're like, we don't like to do that. So they finally got one in his foot. And then we're like, okay, well, why is his leg swollen? Why is it two times the size of his other leg? So at that point, in addition to like, they were still doing, I guess, like, you know, blood sugar checks really frequently, labs really frequently. They had been doing neurologic, uh, like hourly exams. Like we were sleeping. I mean, that was non-existent for most of the time that we were in the hospital, like 45 minutes here and there. Now they were checking like his leg circumference, like every time, like every couple hours um, to see if it was going down. And you know, like another like 12 hours went by and it wasn't going down. And like, I was like, do you think that he needs an ultrasound? They had told us in the beginning that they wanted to get that line out of his leg as soon as possible because there was a high risk for a blood clot. 
you know, I just wasn't comfortable with it. And again, parental instinct kicks in where it's like, okay, first of all, we almost got sent home. Like what, what is the harm at this point to expose him to an ultrasound? Like that's like no big deal. Like just to rule it out and put mm-hmm. my mind at ease. So they did an ultrasound at that point. I, Rob actually went home to go get us clothes. And he also went home to grab COVID tests because at that point, my throat was really raw and the air was really dry there. And I was thinking like, okay, this is probably because it's super dry. But like in the back of my mind, I'm like, what if I'm getting sick? Like, you know, we were in hospitals, we were in the doctor's office. Like, what if I was exposed? Things like that. So I'm here by myself. They do his ultrasound. Rob gets back and probably like an hour after his ultrasound was done, they came in and they're like, he has a blood clot in his leg. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Uh, the kid's okay now, right? He is. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. I needed that. I just want <laughs> to make sure. Jeez. Like, it's just like, you know, like when you feel like things can't get worse, but then they do. <laughs> and then they do again. So, you know, that happens and we're like, well, great. Like now what? And they're like, well, we're going to need to start him on blood thinners right away. So they got the orders in for that. So he was on Lovenox then in the hospital injections twice a day there. I think they actually had one going through his IV at first before he was disconnected from the IV. Anyway, so Rob gets back with those, with all of our stuff and the COVID tests and whatnot. And, you know, by that point, it was like hours later after I start started feeling like that rawness in my throat and, mm. I started to feel like a little congested and I'm like, great. So anyway, I ended up going in the bathroom. Like, I'm just going to do this COVID test. It was positive. Yeah, of course it was. I don't see how uh, I'm waiting for a building to fall on you or something. So like (laughs) the the positive COVID test, you don't even have me there. Was the hospital held up while you were there? Did you have to brandish a weapon to defend it or anything like that? Like how close to die hard did this get exactly? Jesus. What a disaster. Yeah. Where, can you tell me what part of the country you live in without telling me exactly where you live? I can tell you the state. That's fine. Good. We live in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. The western part? Central. Central. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My son went to college <laughs> there. I know what you're yeah. saying. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, so at that point then, I had to tell the nurse, like, you know, because they're in and out constantly. And actually, you know, they were being very lax. Like, they were all masked and, like, visitors were supposed to be masked too. But, like... We were there for so long at that point. Like it was like a couple of days, like they were really lax about us with masks. And so like Rob, Kai and I obviously weren't masked. And, you know, I had to tell the nurse like, hey, I just took a COVID test and it's positive. And so then it went from, you know, I I put on a mask obviously for, you know, out of respect at that point to continue to expose other people. But they ended up moving us to the, what's it called? The negative pressure rooms. Okay. Um, they had like one of those. And so they moved us into there. And then from that point forward, they were in PPE for the rest of the time. And they had to change it every time they came into our room and somebody was in our room like every 20 minutes. <laughs> so I can't imagine how much waste uh, it like pains me. <laughs> gowning and ungowning um, and gowning and ungowning constantly. Yeah, insane, yeah. insane. I mean, because we were there for 11 days and it was like on the third day that we were mm-hmm. diagnosed with COVID. So anyway, so I was positive. At that point, Rob was feeling fine. They had tested Kai. He was negative. And then that night into the next day, Kai spiked a fever overnight and he tested positive for COVID that Well, morning. yeah. I mean, I think we were all waiting for that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yep. Jesus. How, how many decades will it take you to pay the hospital bill? <laughs> I I would love to know like what you know the actual total is. I haven't gone back and looked at that. I don't really want to know. But your insurance is handling it though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Very fortunate for that. You know. Then they were like, okay, well, he obviously has diabetes. You know, he's high risk. He has COVID now. They were like, he's a candidate. They ended up looking into it. He's a candidate for remdesivir. And, you know, like there's like a lot of talk about like what's a good treatment is you know whatnot. Like over you know the time that Mm -hmm. COVID started. And so it's like, you're really hesitant to like give something to your baby. That's, I mean, he's only nine months old and you know, it's not really like that known, but we just trusted them. And obviously we were like, if we don't, and he gets even sicker and we didn't, you know, give him treatment. He's in no situation to like fight a a virus off during all this probably. Yeah. Like he just recovered from DKA. Like he's so weak, you know, he had lost weight from even just the, like when he first got in the hospital, he already had like lost weight. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that was just like a really trying time. He lost his voice. He was coughing. Um, thankfully, like it never went to his lungs. Um, that was obviously like the greatest fear. Tem- you know, temperature checks. Like, so we had like all of these checks. And so really there was somebody in there like every 20, 30 minutes. So anyway, and at one point, like his his temperature actually went like the other way. And they're like, like hypothermia. <laughs> And like they come in and they have these clothes, like these random clothes and like they're bundling him up in like this random, like, I don't know if they had like a donation, like they took in donations of clothing and he's like in this like little like baseball, like it was like a baseball, uh, like sleeper. And then they, they put him in that and then they like put him in this little sweatshirt. Like they had him all bundled up. It was just crazy. And then the next day, Rob ended up starting to feel bad. So you know, here we are, like, we are feeling awful. They're like trying and, you know, like at that point, like most people would be starting to get like diabetes education mm-hmm. and like the nutritionists and things like that. But we were like, literally like on like death's doorstep, like we got COVID really bad. Yeah. Like every single symptom that you could possibly have. Oh, the two of you uh, were, oh my God. We, did you poop? We your, did you poop so yourself, sick. Brianna? Did you make poopy in your mm-hmm. pants? There was a top bad, was it? No. <laughs> Thankfully, that thankfully that did not happen. I, I imagine you've just been like, yeah, sure, why not? So <laughs> I mean, I mean, things couldn't get any worse at that so point. Were you so. you were living in this in this room in this pressure room, right? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. We couldn't leave at that point. So at first, like we could at least go out and like you know alternate like going to like the little cafe area, or you know Rob would go and grab us like breakfast or a coffee or whatever. And then we were like completely in isolation. Like they had to get us things if we needed it. And it was like- They bring you cots? How big was the room? I'm sorry, I have a lot of questions. How big was the room? It was actually a really big room. Okay. But you, Rob, it, Kai, in this mm-hmm. in this room, this pr- what do they mm-hmm. call them again? Pressure? What do they call them? It's like negative, negative pressure. Negative pressure rooms, right? So yeah. that means when they open the door, like airborne stuff can't break the door seal. It just right. stays- in. So they're basically, this is a zombie movie now. They're like, we'll mm-hmm. just keep the three of them in there until they die yeah. and then we'll scrape them out yeah. back. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. No yeah. one looked like they were going to shoot you, right? They weren't like, we'll put them no. down, nothing like that. Okay, good, good, good. Unfortunately. Um, unfortunately. I <laughs> or not, you, not what, unfortunately, <laughs> not, I said, no, fortunately, fortunately. I'm saying, uh, and you got really, so you had the the sweats and then, oh, yeah. go ahead. Tell yeah. me about your COVID yeah. for a second. Long story short, I, I, it was the same thing, like what you just said, like I was sweating, but then I'd get really cold. So this mm-hmm. is like something that stands out in my mind. I kept turning up the thermostat in the room whenever I would get cold. And then it would be like a thousand degrees in there. And like, you know, the staff would be coming in and out. And like, I will never forget the one of the endocrinologists like in the room trying to talk to us about, you know, they were trying to get like, they were trying to get him Dexcom right away. So, you know, like talking to us about that and like she was like sweating, like she's in her PPE and like you could like see like beads. <laughs> oh, my God. The first time I had COVID, it was like the sweats were crazy uh-huh. and then exhaustion uh-huh. in like middle of the day. Then I was kind of OK. And then I got freezing yeah. cold and then that went back and right. forth all day. And then I couldn't sleep at night. I'd sit up mm-hmm. sweating from like 9 p.m. till 6 a.m. Then I would sleep from like 6 a.m. to like 9 a.m. And then I'd get up and make the podcast and then I would do it all over again. It went on for like a week and a half. There are episodes of the podcast where I re- I recorded them sitting here wrapped in blankets or sitting here in a T-shirt dripping like I was coming off a of meth. Like, like there's like, <laughs> like, and I'm just like, you'll never know when you listen to them. But I'm very proud of myself because I was like dying. You got through it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so you went through that stuck in that room. Was there arguing or were you too sick to argue? If you take insulin or sulfonylureas, you are at risk for your blood sugar going too low. You need a safety net when it matters most. Be ready with Gvoke Hypopen. My daughter carries Gvoke Hypopen everywhere she goes because it's a ready-to-use rescue pen for treating very low blood sugar in people with diabetes ages 2 and above that I trust. Low blood sugar emergencies can happen unexpectedly, and they demand quick action. Luckily, Givo Kypopen can be administered in two simple steps, even by yourself in certain situations. Show those around you where you store Givo Kypopen and how to use it. They need to know how to use Givo Kypopen before an emergency situation happens. Learn more about why Givo Kypopen is in Arden's Diabetes Toolkit at givoglucagon.com. Slash juice box. 
Givoke shouldn't be used if you have a tumor in the gland on the top of your kidneys called a pheochromocytoma, or if you have a tumor in your pancreas called an insulinoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk for safety information. Oh, no, no, we were, we definitely, like, we were just so, like, we're sad, we're, like, worried, we're feeling awful, like, we're just trying to feel better, and, like, you know, we weren't sleeping, and, you know, you're sick, you need to sleep to get better, and, like, we couldn't really sleep. There were a couple of times that, like, we literally just, like, shut off. Like, I remember one time, I was just, like, I, I literally cannot stay awake anymore, even though I wanted to. Like, I had that feeling that I didn't want to sleep because I didn't want to miss anything. I didn't, sure. like, the doctors coming in, the checks, like, what what was this result, you know? But one time I just had to shut off and I, I went to sleep. And we were talking about that the other day, actually. Rob told me that there was, like, a time that they had to come in and get a, get a blood draw. And he was just, like, absolutely, like, hysterical. Uh, Kai was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he said, like, how he felt so alone in that moment because I was actually, I, I was in the same room. I was sleeping on the couch, but I was, like, literally passed out you know it was just like a really like low moment for him i guess like you know you're in this realization you're feeling awful your baby's you know you just feel helpless so it was just like a lot of that um and just trying to feel better so that you could take in the information that they're trying to tell you so another moment that stands out to me is you know i was so sleep deprived and i remember i was sitting in a recliner holding kai and our endocrinologist same one (laughs) was talking to us and trying to explain something about diabetes and his insulin regimen and things like that and what they were going to try to do. And I was just like nodding off. Like I was literally like head going down, falling asleep. (laughs) And she's like saying to Rob, like, is she okay? And he's like, oh yeah, (laughs) she's fine. (laughs) Like, Don't worry. Everything's fine. We're all fine. Nothing to worry about here. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, so anyway, so, okay. Time goes on. Obviously, we're starting. We're we had to have a video visit with hematologist uh, from the main hospital that our hospital system is part of. They didn't have a pediatric hematologist, you know, on site. So they came out like once a month to our endocrinology office. It's like a multi specialty group for pediatrics, and. They, we were going to end up meeting with them after the hospital, but we had a video consult with them so that they could explain to us, like, after Kai gets out of the hospital, like, he has this blood clot, and, like, we need to talk to you about, like, what's going to happen. Like, he, first of all, is going to need to be on uh, blood thinners twice a day for three months, probably. Mm-hmm. And also, he's going to have to have ultrasounds again to check, like, every six weeks to see if the blood clot's going away. And they explained it, like, you know, the Lovenox, the blood thinner, is not to dissolve the blood clot. Like, that's not what it's for. It's to make it less sticky so blood stops attaching to it Mm. and, like, making it larger, which obviously is then, like, higher risk, you know, as the blood clot gets larger and things like that. And, you know, so we're like, well, what happens if the blood clot does dislodge and goes somewhere else? Like, you know, so now we have to be scared of that. Like, is his blood clot going to cause a stroke? You know, is it going to go to his heart? you know, things like that. So like, not only do we have now a newly diagnosed type one diabetic, we have COVID, this blood clot issue, like, you know, that he got from the IV that obviously was needed to save his life, but now also is threatening his life. Yep. And now we're going to have to give him injections of, you know, blood thinners. They did also explain that the, like, if the blood clot sticks around um, and if it gets larger because of where it was and how it was blocking, like there was a potential, like it could be there forever and then it could potentially like cause him problems. Like, or, yeah, oh my gosh. Jeez. Yeah. Like it could cause like discoloration of his leg. It could cause like cramps in his leg. Like if he played sports in the future, like it could cause issues with that. He might need like stockings forever. Compression. Yeah. 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 Like, so like, again, we're like reeling, like how can this literally get any worse? Right. Did you find out? Did it get worse? We started to get better. He got his Dexcom on. They came in, trained us on that. And I was super thankful that like that was like a, you know, like some kids and I'm so blown away by this um, are sent away, like especially like really little without a CGM. And I just, I find that really wrong Mm -hmm. because like it's, I feel like in this day and age, it's like unnecessary and archaic to, to do that. It's just, yeah. Anyway, so our our hospital was like amazing with that. Our doctors were amazing, like getting him technology right away, you know, especially given his age. And like they just didn't really know. Like they ended up giving him so they started him on Lantus and 
Humalog, and they gave him his like first doses um, subcutaneous, like after he was off of the IV and like the drip and everything. They gave him his Lantus and his Humalog at the same time, and they ended up like just tanking him completely. Like there was nurses in there and were like piping glucose gel in his mouth, like you know, and that's kind of like our first experiences with Lowe's then. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're freaking out. Like, oh, we got to give, you know, we, <laughs> it just was like really scary. And um, <laughs> it's great you know, when and they're then, freaking course, out, isn't it? You're like, well, I don't know what I'm talking about, but they, sh oh God, they don't know either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, you know, then of course he's like back up to three, 400 after the glucose gel and yeah. things like that. So this kind of like went on and then they realized that they could not even use like the Humalog Junior pen, like the half unit pen and keep him stable like even like if he was 400 that it was too much so at that point they realized that they needed to get him on a pod on omnipod so that they could dose smaller amounts and they were amazing at getting that prior off sent through like super super quick because i think they basically told the insurance like this kid's either going to stay in the hospital on like a drip because we can't even control it with a pen mm -hmm. or, you know, injections, or you're going to give them an Omnipod. And we actually ended up, I think, so we had Dexcom on like day three and then Omnipod uh, trainer came in on, it was just a doctor. We had the Dexcom trainer there. Omnipod on day five. So the doctor came in and put the first one on and, you know, explained about the PDM and things like that. You know, they were able to do his basal, which his basal was 0 0.05, of course, per hour. Um, he was only 16 pounds when we were in the hospital. He dropped down to like 15. So he was like super, super insulin sensitive. My daughter is 20 years old. I can't even believe it. She was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was two, and she put her first insulin pump on when she was four. That insulin pump was an Omnipod, and it's been an Omnipod every day since then. That's 16 straight years of wearing Omnipod. It's been a friend to us, and I believe it could be a friend to you omnipod.com slash juice box. Whether you get the Omnipod Dash or the automation that's available with the Omnipod 5, you are going to enjoy tubeless insulin pumping. You're going to be able to jump into a shower or a pool or a bathtub without taking off your pump. That's right. You will not have to disconnect to bathe with an Omnipod. You also won't have to disconnect to play a sport or to do anything where a regular tube pump has to come off. Arden has been wearing an Omnipod for 16 years. She knows other people that wear different pumps, and she has never once asked the question, should I be trying a different pump? Never once. Omnipod.com slash juice box. Get a pump that you'll be happy with forever. You've probably heard me talk about US Med and how simple it is to reorder with US Med using their email system. But did you know that if you don't see the email, and you're set up for this. You have to set it up. They don't just randomly call you. But I'm set up to be called if I don't respond to the email because I don't trust myself uh, 100%. So one time I didn't respond to the email. And the phone rings at the house. It's like, ring. You know how it works. And I picked it up. I was like, hello. And it was just the recording. It was like, you asked med. Doesn't actually sound like that. But you know what I'm saying. It said, hey, you're, uh, I don't remember exactly what it says. But it's basically like, hey, your order's ready. You want us to send it? Push this button if you want us to send it. Or if you'd like to wait, I think it, it lets you put it off like a couple of weeks or push this button for that. That's pretty much it. I push the button to send it. And a few days later, box right at my door. That's it. USmed.com slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. Get your free benefits checked now and get started with US Med. Dexcom, Omnipod, Tandem, Freestyle. They've got all your favorites. Even that new eyelet pump. Check them out now at usmed.com slash juice box or by calling 888-721-1514. There are links in the show notes of your podcast player and links at juiceboxpodcast.com to US Med and to all of the sponsors. So after the first pod change, he ended up having like a, a low and like we're sitting there and, you know, he, he was dropping on Dexcom and his head like he was sitting in my lap and his head just kind of like started like bobbing a little bit and he got like super sleepy and like we're trying to like rouse him and you know obviously he was feeling low especially after being you know 500 blood sugar sure. for so long and 
So we're like, okay, you know, they treated him, whatever. And then we ended up having a pod failure in the middle of the night, I think that next night. And the doctor had to come in at like four or five o'clock in the morning because they were giving him boluses and nothing was happening. And she was changing it out. And probably like an hour or two hours after that, he ended up having another low. And she actually was in there and you could see the fear in her face. This is the endocrinologist. And she was actually piping peaches, like through a syringe, like baby food peaches into his mouth. And then she's like, you know, get glucose gel and, you know, like give him more, give him more. And like, okay, it's fine. Give him more. <laughs> you could just tell she was like really you know, kind of like what's going on. Yeah. So like that happened. And then like Rob and I started talking about it and we're like, okay, so this is like, Weird. Like he got this pod on. He's had now two pods on. And why is he having like these seeming like low blood sugars after he gets these pods on? Like, you know, he's on such little amounts and, you know, things like that. So there was another intensivist. She was like really awesome. We actually had issues with Kai feeding while we were there. So I was sick with COVID and actually my breast milk supply tanked completely. Mm -hmm. Like I was not producing like barely anything. You were and, probably very you know, dehydrated too. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 And super stressed and which is a huge part of it. And, you know, COVID actually is known to tank supplies and he was like refusing to eat. So they I actually have this picture of all of the different formulas. They had all these uh, formulas line that they brought in. He would not take a single formula because he was never formula fed and, it, you know, he just didn't want it. And mm -hmm. they had apple juice, uh, like a toddler, like apple and carrot pouch. We ended up ultimately like trying to give him cow's milk, which you're not supposed to do until after one. I and mean, that was literally the only thing that he would like maybe take like a little bit of it. Okay. And so that's how we kind of got by. But like at one point, the doctor's like, we have to get him to eat something because she couldn't dose him insulin and like figure out what his ratios and things like that were because yeah. he wouldn't eat. I mean, how much does he weigh at that point? 15 pounds. Yeah. I Listen, Arden weighed 19 pounds and I couldn't do it. And she was eating. You know, after she got out of the hospital, it was freaking impossible almost. If yeah. You would have taken food away from her. I don't know what I would have been able to do. Yeah. Yeah. It was just crazy. And we're just like, well, I, I'm like, I don't know what to do. So like they were trying to like, they had like a lactation consultant in, like trying to like be able to like up my supply so like he could, you know, hopefully eat something. So it's like very like small amounts of ounces. Like, the, you know, we were trying to like then, you know, bottle feed him. And he would take, obviously, and then he was taking a little bit of the cow's milk. So it was like after a couple of days, um, but this one awesome, awesome intensivist, she was so sweet. She actually went to like Trader Joe's and she, like we had told her, um, we actually were doing baby led weaning. Have you ever heard? Or yeah. Baby led weaning? Like L-E-A-D. Is that what it's called? I don't know. Baby led. Hold on. <laughs> I can find out. Hold on a second. I got Google. Yeah, that's what it's called. I'm like thinking of like... It just meaning, sounds like, weird uh, when you say it fast. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, instead of like doing purees and things, like you pretty much just go into like finger foods. Right. And um, so we were in the process of, we were trying to do a hundred different foods by age one. And we were up to 40 foods like right before he was diagnosed. And, you know, so it was really fun. We were actually like recording every single new food that he ate like his reaction to everything. So it was like a fun experience and like, just like that, trying to hit that goal of a hundred food. So anyway, we told her like, you know, at home, he really liked like berries, you know, things like that. And so she actually went out to Trader Joe's and got him like fresh blueberries, strawberries. She got him like fishy crackers and things you knew he would eat. Yeah. Like yeah. that he would potentially like try. So, and she brought back like stuff for us. Like the one day she's like, you know, I knew you guys are like stuck in here. She's like, I'm going for coffee. Would you like anything? Like, it was just like really comforting, you know, like you don't really get that a lot with like a healthcare provider that she's going to go out and get your kid food and, oh, you know, okay. bring you coffee. Brianna, and, at some point they were probably like these poor people, like, do you know yeah, what I mean? Like, I and, and you'd been there for 10, 11 days. They, they probably felt like yeah. they knew you at that point, you know? Yeah. Like, and we did express like to her too, like at that point. So she was the one who really listened to us when we told her, told her about the pods. We're like, look, something is happening. Something is not right here. Like when he gets these pods on, it seems like he, his blood sugar is dropping. And, you know, she's like, I, I get it. Like, you know, like she knew she had heard around, I'm sure. Cause like there were nurses involved, the doctors involved at these like times that they're like, you know, piping glucose gel and peaches and things in his mouth. So she listened. And I was like, at that point, like frantically, like searching the internet for 
information about Omnipod. And I think at that point I had already found, I think I found Juicebox while I was still in the hospital mm. because I was already like a group person uh, prior to all of this. Like I have a group for everything, like all, everything, crafting, vacations, you name it. I have a group for it. Um, <laughs> and I was just like searching, like, it does, has anybody had this reaction to the pods? And I did end up coming across something on the Omnipod, their manual, and it talked about a priming dose. So when the pod is placed and you pinch the skin up and that cannula inserts, that insulin that goes into the tube, like obviously is touching the infusion site. What, like he was so insulin sensitive that you know, we then had the thought that that priming bolus was then causing him to tank. Okay. Even that, that little bit, geez. Yeah. So, you know, like we couldn't prove it obviously. And so then our doctor like reached out to the insulate rep and was like, Hey, like we have this baby, we're having this issue. Um, whenever we'd put the pods on and, you know, at first, like they didn't really like kind of like believe it, I guess you would say. And then like after, like, I think he got three pods total in the hospital and we ended up because of like who was on call, we had all three endocrinologists. The first one, the gentleman, he was only like day one. And then the other two female um, endocrinologists, they had us pretty much for like the rest of the days that we were there. Mm -hmm. And so they got to witness a lot, obviously. And like the third time it happened, like the endocrinologist um, who we ultimately ended up with, you know, she got to experience it too, because she also had an event where she was, you know, piping glucose gel into his mouth with a syringe. And you could just, again, see the fear in these doctor's eyes, like what's going on. Yeah. And so, you know, they ended up talking to their colleagues back at like the main hospital, because when they had um, backing up, when they, when she reached out to insulin, they're like, no, like the rep was like, no, like, I don't think there's anything like that, that, you know, like there's no prime bolus, but like on the actual manual it, it does say that so walk me through so that so you're because yeah. you you prime an omnipod before you put it on right okay and then you put it on and it inserts right. and then what happens right. so like that insulin that's in that tube like obviously then you know connects starts with the to work infusion in. site and that uh, yeah and that for somebody your son's size and in Correct. situation and not eating is a lot of right. insulin yeah i got it right yeah and so they actually then talked to their colleagues. So the doctors like reached out to their colleagues at the main hospital and they ended up coming up with a, a protocol for pump changes for Kai. And like, I cringe at it now because they actually like wanted his blood sugar, like over 400 to put a pump on him, to put a pot on him. And, and, and this is just really the amount of insulin that's in the cannula, which is mm -hmm. very short to begin with. And right. and then once it's in, it inserted, it's not like mm -hmm. it was pushing more. It was just kind of whatever uh, was touching, seeping. I guess is the word I'm looking right. for, right? Which yeah. is probably just an. It's probably just a couple of drops of insulin. I'm I'm trying to think about it. Probably only a few drops. And when you think of like a drop of insulin, like especially when he's on a basal of 0.05, and at that point his boluses were like 0.05, oh, yeah, and 0.1. Yeah. Oh no! Listen, when Arden was two years old, even I had teach myself. I don't know. If how many people have listened how far back I, the yeah, I heard yeah, like but you had to I used to take insulin put it in a dish color it with food coloring and oh, then and then I would draw it into the syringe and then I would practice pushing on the plunger to get one drop to come out so I put the food wow. coloring in so I could practice by the way not to inject it and okay. and so what I would do is I would practice over and over again visually this is how much pressure lets out a drop of insulin from the syringe and then I'd start doing it with my eyes closed because you can't see the end of the syringe when it's inserted. Right. When I could do it with my eyes closed, then I would sometimes inject Arden with a drop of insulin because that was enough and any more was too much. Right. Exactly. Yeah, right. So it's like nearly impossible without a pump, you know, for a child that's small. That, and yeah. like you're really stressing yourself out. And I mean, like, look at all the work you had to do to go through just like hopefully mm -hmm. <laughs> getting the right dose. Yeah. Bro, that's all I was shooting for. I was like, well, I uh, and like uh, literally, like I can feel myself now with my thumb, like it's a little bit of pressure, like that's enough, pull it out. Right. And and that was, yeah. and you, you could only put like, I would only put like a half a unit in there just so I could get enough pressure to get a drop out. 
And that right. I went on for a while, by the way, because she was probably honeymooning too at some point, to be perfectly honest with you. I didn't even know what a honeymoon was back then. Right. So I, I'm uh, that guy in that story is not the guy you're talking to right now. Like he was <laughs> in a full on panic. <laughs> so, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. And I mean, especially too, when you're dealing with a child that small and like, you know, like I was a new mom still, I was like, not even like, I didn't even feel like myself again yet. Yeah. Like I felt like I wasn't even like, you know, really like into motherhood, like when all of this oh my happens, God, no. like, and COVID and, you know, the, yeah. the experience of being in that room for that long, that's gotta be overwhelming. Yeah. You, you and know? then this thing happening that they like literally didn't even know what was happening. So yeah. the plan that they set up then when they sent us away from the hospital was to take the, stop the basal, take the old pump site off an hour before the site change. So obviously then he's not getting any basal. Mm -hmm. So make sure that he's more than 300 by finger stick before that. After the site change, feed him again and keep the basal discontinued for an hour. If after an hour his blood sugar was more than 350, we would turn the basal on, but only for five minutes and turn it back off. Was this an overcorrection or is this actually what was necessary? Sounds like an overcorrection to me. That's what I'm wondering. Well, yeah. well, so I, we started documenting them because like eventually like I would love to, you know, potentially like speak to somebody Omnipod um, or Insulet just so, you know, like if this happens, like I'm fine with it. Like I just don't want something to happen to another small child like it happened to us and that uncertainty and the fear. Like I am a hundred percent Omnipod, I absolutely love it. Our life would not be the same without it. Huge advocate. But in the same token, like if he would have been in range and us not do what we do now, like, so for instance, like there was a time where we did a pod change and he was, I hate to say this, 454. We were newly out of the hospital mm -hmm. and breast milk sent him to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> and so like at 830, he was 454. And by... 1045, you know, so two hours later, he was already 226. In that time, he had more milk. Um, so he had like fed again. He had dropped like 200 points. And then there was another couple of times that we had documented that it was like the same, like he's dropping like 250 points. There was one he dropped over 200 points in one hour. From a pod chain, from a pot, from putting a new pot on. Yes, with yeah. the basal off. Right. No insulin on. And he would have been in range like at 100. Uh, you know, 150 when that happened, you know, like obviously we'd be dealing with like feeding a low that we had no idea where it ended, you know, so it was like really scary. And, you know, it took us a really long time to kind of like figure out a regimen for that. So she was thinking like by turning the basal back on for five minutes that like any insulin that might've been in the cannula would be delivered, like any extra, and then like turn it off again because like he would have gotten that insulin that they thought could be in there. Yeah. So basically just like observe for the next hour. Like if his blood sugar was like steady, then turn the basal back on. If he was like below 300, keep the basal off until he was like leveled out. Brianna, has this experience made you better at diabetes? Like in hindsight? Yeah, I would say. Because... First of all, let me say this. Omnipod is not FDA approved for people under two. So you guys were right, using it exactly. off label, which is fine. But I'm going to assume that what they would say is, well, yeah, that's an amount of insulin that, I mean, this is just how the pod works. And for larger people, it's it's a nominal amount that doesn't mean anything. But, right, um, exactly. But my, my, my bigger question is, because it feels like you were like a lot of trial by fire and a lot of mm -hmm. getting to see how insulin works. And I exactly. would, I, I'm wondering now, it's a year and a half later, right? Is mm -hmm. that right? Like, what's Kai's A1C right now? Last time it was 7.1, down from 11 at diagnosis. Nice. And that, and he's still little. He's how old? Yeah. He's 26 pounds and he's a little over two. Yeah. He's still little. He's like really low percentile still. And do you feel like, do you feel confident about using insulin? Do you get what you expect? I guess is my question. Yeah. And I remember feeling like, so like I was like on top of the world, the one time where we did a pod change for like the first time when he was like in range and like, we knew the drop was coming and we just like fed it, you know, with yeah. like, as, as soon as he started dropping, it's like, okay, give him some carbs, wait, started dropping again, give him some carbs, wait until he like leveled out. And I like, I felt like amazing like yeah. that time that we like did a pod change. I did this thing 
and I knew what was going to happen. And then I made a change and it went the way I expected it to. It's such a good feeling. You know? yeah, yeah. So it, it really like affected a lot of stuff though. So like, you know, so when, so when we went back, uh, like three days later after we got discharged from the hospital, that was when our next pod change was, and they wanted us to do it in the hospital and in the doctor's office. So outpatient and it happened again, of course, like while we were there. And so at that point they knew like a hundred percent, like, even though it's like, okay, no, this wasn't happening. They actually were like, okay, yeah, this is happening. Like we've now seen it like four times. And the diabetes educator was actually the one who recommended tapping the pods out. And so what we do is when you take off the blue plastic piece, oh, not I, the reservoir I still do part this, where, by the way. You do? Yeah, I, I've done it for years. You, I pinch the yeah. back of the pod and then I slap the middle of it onto my finger. Yeah. And, yep. then, and, then, so, and then the quick stop knocks out. Like I do it for condensation re- reasons under the window. Because you knock right. out that con- you knock out that extra in the window from the priming, and then you don't get the condensation build up. Right. So, yeah. and I'm sure you've noticed, like you see insulin on your hand, like yeah. there's, and sometimes it's a really like a good bit. And so for him, like we've actually like kind of reverse engineered the amount of like with the amount of carbs we had to give him, and like I think that it's probably up to like a point five like a half unit Mm -hmm. um, sometimes with how much we've had to feed him like after the drop happens. So now what we do is like, we actually just had a pod change last night. We do like, depending on where he's at, like if he's in range and at a really good number, we'll turn his basal off for an hour. Like just so he's not getting, you know, even more and extra because he just got some like basically like a bolus with the pod change and we just don't know how much. And so if he's high, not at a number that we want, we'll we'll still tap it. We'll put the pot on, keep the basil on, and we'll do like half of a correction, like whatever that is. We still usually have to catch it, but it's not, you know, like we know it's going to happen now. But like the way that it affected us, like we couldn't do like a pod change on the go or, you know, because we'd be in the car and he'd be dropping. He's a baby. Like we really can't, you know give him low treatments a lot of times in the car plus he gets car sick like it's this Mm. this thing and then you know we can't do pod changes like within a certain amount of time before bed still because of the drop and we know it's going to happen so it it limits things a little bit but again like i said it's just you know i'm so thankful and i just really think that um that's like one of the things i really wanted to emphasize was you know i really just think that especially a a baby a toddler like pushing for a pump like as soon as possible, just to save like the parents, like the anguish, like you had to go through with the yeah. food coloring. Oh my god! <laughs> and <laughs> you know, trying to yeah. yeah, and like chasing your baby around, you know, trying to give them shots, and like a t- a toddler and a baby is different than you know, like an older kid where you can say like, hey, we have to wait a little bit for a snack. Like a toddler's grazing all day long, and we'd be like, ch- we'd either have to give him like you know, zero carb snacks in between injections or be chasing him around all day with a needle. And that's just not something, you know, I really feel like you're a toddler's hard enough. Right. A baby's hard enough. Like you're already going through a drastic life change. Having the good good tools is a big deal. Like it just really is, you know? Yeah, it's huge. And so I definitely would, you know, like if you're newly diagnosed and like, I just like feel so sad for the people that I see in the group that like their doctors like know they want us to learn how to be like MDI first or do finger sticks before they get a CGM and yeah, you know, just in case it fails. But like, I feel like it's kind of like saying, you know, I don't know. I just feel like it's really antiquated because you can always go back and learn a new skill. That's fine. Um, Or they could have you, figure it out in the hospital and like you still have to do finger sticks even with a cgm so like that doesn't make any sense to me you know like they can have you draw up in a syringe like they actually had us do that in the hospital to practice and you know inject like they had the little you know plastic thing or like some people have an orange or whatever that you like inject into and things like that so and especially for like a small child like it's just so uncertain and you know, I just think it's just so necessary to try to, you know, arm those people with, with the technology, like, because we have it. Why yeah. would you not? Yeah, no, I listen, I agree. I've heard arguments for the other side and there's nothing wrong with learning how to do MDI and you should know no, how to do absolutely it. But, not. Yeah. but I mean, the length of time being six months or a year is right. kind of silly at some point. You yeah. Know? 
There's that. So yeah, so we got out of the hospital, like things, you know, we kind of like got to know like the whole Omnipod, you know, we got our whole thing down with that. You know, we had a lot of follow-ups. We had the blood clot follow-ups. And um, also one of the concerns we had whenever we got out of the hospital was, you know, he's on a blood thinner. Um, He cannot hit his head. He can't fall or, you know, like you have to be really careful because he could get a brain bleed. And mind you, he's nine months old. He's not even walking yet, like when we were in the hospital. And so, you know, he's learning then to walk on this blood thinner. And so, like, that was, like, a really stressful thing that we had to go through. Also, he was barely on table food. So, like, you know, learning to dose for, like, obviously every single food was not only new to learn how to dose for, but new to see if he would even like it. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and he was eating so little. You know, we had a couple of instances like early on that were like, you know, some scary lows. We had a time he was on an antibiotic where he was definitely not absorbing carbs. And it was like kind of like a middle of the night situation. And, you know, he was in like the 60s and he just like we're giving him like straight glucose gel and he just like wasn't going up. Mm. And that like just kind of stuck with me. The hospital was like really traumatic, like that whole experience with like the nurses and doctors being scared and us being scared and like those those experiences just like really, really affected me for a long time and like being really scared of lows. So obviously, like, you know, I think a lot of people like are higher to start, you know, until we like really felt more comfortable with things. I remember, you know, like I really could not take on any more information after his diagnosis. Like it was just so much and so overwhelming and, you know, so many appointments that like, I didn't really like start listening to the podcast until probably I would say like about nine months, like not like religiously. Yeah. I I listened to some here and there, but the first one I listened to, I think um, besides like maybe a couple of like the bold beginnings or defining diabetes, but fear of insulin, because that's what I had. Mm -hmm. And like, I've now listened to that like multiple times. Like when I kind of get back in that, you know, that mindset, Cause it's like, I almost go back to it. And more recently I've actually had like a major regression. Yeah. Tell Sorry. me, no, tell me please. So like we hit a year and like things were going really, really good. Like in, in Dexcom, like the GMI was down to like actually 6.7. Like I like that year mark was like something that I felt like would be pivotal for me. I remember you saying, and actually one of my other favorite ep- episodes is like the time that I decided to share. Mm-hmm. And like giving yourself like this time frame, like, okay, I'm going to be okay after this. Or, you know, like I'll, I'll have it kind of figured out. And like, I was just like from kind of like nine months to a year, I felt like I was doing like amazing. Like we were actually like having meals where he like wasn't spiking over 180 and, you know, just in really good control. And, you know, these past couple of months, there were two times and one of them was actually after a pod change, even after we had all of this experience, but we had to change a pod in the middle of the night. And, you know, we set alarms, like we know it's going to happen. And even no matter how much we tap out the pod, how much, you know, if we keep the basil off that kind of thing, like it's going to happen where he's going to drop at least some. And we set an alarm, but I guess he dropped sooner than that. So like our, our other alarms, our backup alarms were going off yeah. and it was like, the reading, we have a sugar pixel. The reading was like 89 minus 12 or something when we sat up and looked at it. And immediately, like, you know, we go and we're like sitting him up and like, you know, one of us went and grabbed juice and like sat him up immediately, like, Kai, drink. And, you know, like even before doing the finger stick, but um, when we did the finger stick, he was already like 62. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's just out of sleep that you're sitting this like poor two-year-old up And shoving a straw in his mouth and he like didn't want to he was crying he's like hey uh my blood sugar is dropping really fast and i'm asleep what the hell yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah. who are you people and get out of my room (laughs) yeah Yeah. and so you know like he he drank a little bit but then i grabbed a pack of applesauce i'm like squeezing that in his mouth you know he's pushing it away from me you know i told rob i'm like go grab anything literally anything and you know so we're like grabbing like we had a lollipop we had like we don't really have you know, a lot of snack foods a lot, but we had happened to have Oreos, you know, we were trying to give him like anything at that point because he wouldn't take anything. So I ended up like taking the icing out of the middle of the Oreo and just like shoving it in his mouth. Good, good call. Um, On the cheeks, by the way. Put yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the inside of your cheeks. And yeah. And so like he ended up taking like a little bit more applesauce. Like I did a finger stick like a couple of minutes later after that and he was 52. 
you know, and we just tried to get as much as we could in him because again, we were kind of at that peak time where the pod was changed and the insulin, you know, or the pod, the insulin was at its peak Yeah, and, you know, he obviously was dropping rapidly. And so, you know, that, that was like really traumatic again, and kind of brought back all of those thoughts from the hospital. Of course. And, and then we had another one that was actually kind of similar scenario, but he was awake and we just kind of like waited. We, you know, we didn't want to give him carbs too soon when he was dropping from another change and we kind of hit it a little bit too late and he was like in the sixties again. And he, it was just like, he was just dropping really rapidly. And so just like after those two experiences, it was weird. I just like had this like regression. Like I all of a sudden got super scared. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Like completely. Like I feel like I just got out of the hospital and it's like, you know, Rob is like so even keeled and like, he's like totally the one in the situation and this like entire thing. Like he's like, you know, kind of got the diagnosis, like obviously like grieved, but like move on. This is our life. He's amazing. He's healthy besides, you know, besides Mm -hmm. this. And like, for me, I went through the stages of grief over and over and over again, like the time in the months after. Yeah. And that's the thing, like, I feel like is because like, I always wanted to be a mom. I feel like I did everything right during my pregnancy. I was like all organic. I didn't eat lunch meat. I, you know, didn't have nitrates or nitrates and um, didn't use anything with like chemicals, like for, you know, body products and things like that. And it's like, I just felt like I did everything right. And like, here I am. And this is our life now. And so that was like really, really hard for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, we got to that year mark and like we were doing so good. And then just like recently I like regressed and he's like, come on. He's like, you know, like, you know, this, like you're smart, you know, this trust, you know, like the whole thing, like what's going, your, your motto of trust that, you know, what's going to happen is going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Like he's like, Brianna carbs, like juice will stop any, anything like it'll turn it around. and you know, but like, I cannot, like sometimes like I just, it just went out the window. So I'm like really working on that recently. I feel like I'm doing a lot better in the past like couple of weeks. And ironically, it's like, you know, happened before this like recording. And like when I signed up to do the recording, actually, like it was kind of around that year mark, uh, like a little bit after, and like we were doing really, really good. And it's like, I'm going to go on here and talk about like, you know, we're doing great. I'm kicking ass. Now your ass is getting kicked. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Well, it'll go back again though. Like, I mean, are you consciously working on it or, or like, you know what I mean? Like, what are you doing to try to get yourself back to that place? Just like, you know, again, like re, like I said, like, uh, you know, going back and like listening to like that podcast episode again, I'll out myself. Um, I like did an anonymous post in the group, um, which I love that there's that feature there because it's like, you know, sometimes you want to put yourself out there, but sometimes you don't, especially if you feel like it's a stupid question, but I'm like, you know, was there ever a time that like, you know, juice didn't work for you, like, or like didn't catch the low, you know, obviously, aside from being unconscious, um, like, it was just really good to hear, like, like, really seasoned diabetics, like saying, like, no, like, it works like a charm every time, you know, that kind of thing. And that's really helped me. And just like reading other people's experiences and things like that. And just like trying to remember that, like, we've been at this for a while now. And the other thing, too, that's like been really frustrating in our doctor, like at our last visit, could really tell. Um, we went from like time and range of like 70 to 90%, even a hundred percent day to like 40 and 50. And that's you being timid. That's you being timid with insulin again. Um, it's over treating lows sometimes, but Mm -hmm. actually more recently it's because we keep having pod failures. So our son is now two and he is extremely, extremely active. And I'm assuming, so we get a lot of occlusions Our doctor did tell us that it's more common in kids because their body's just like healing so quickly and like cells are turning over so quickly and things like that. Okay. And like you can actually see the occlusion, like when you take it off, it's white. Like the cells like gathered at the tip and like basically his body tried to heal against the cannula. Mm -hmm. So we'll have that happen. And then what I assume is tunneling, like from him knocking it loose, like I'll take the pot off and I can see like kind of like a bubble of insulin at the infusion site. Like you, like we never, his doses are so small that like we never would get like wet adhesive or anything around it Mm -hmm. because it's not that much that's coming out, but there's insulin there when I take the pot off. And obviously like, you know, we're bolusing and, you know, things aren't, aren't working. How frequently does that happen when it gets occluded? Like how many hours is it on before that happens sometimes? 
usually a couple hours, but we pretty much have gotten the motto, like when in doubt, change it out for sure. We actually did back in September have like a DKA scare. He was fine. He was like trending down all night and like he got down to the point where, you know, he was going to go low. And I ended up like giving him a little bit of apple juice and he just kind of like shot up and I'm like, okay, maybe I gave him a little bit more juice than he needed. And I actually had to go to a doctor's appointment like an hour away that morning. And so I was like getting ready. I gave him a bolus like because I overtreated or so I thought. And, you know, an hour went by. It didn't really do much. I'm like, okay, I gave him another bolus, told Rob like, hey, I did this. I'm leaving. And, you know, I got there and I looked and his like number still was like going up. I'm like, okay, something doesn't seem right. And I'm like, you have to get him up and get him moving around because sometimes like it kind of gets stagnant. Like his insulin doesn't start moving until he's moving. When he's sedentary, it, it doesn't work as well. Yeah. 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 That's for everybody, by the way, not just, not just him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, I'm like, get him up, get him moving around, get him drinking, you know, fluids and see, you know, if it's, it, it starts moving. So anyway, you know, kind of time goes by and, you know, nothing really happens. And, you know, he's making him breakfast, which he pretty much has like eggs and breakfast meat or something most mornings. And, I'm like, if it doesn't change like really soon, like we're going to, I was like, you need to change it out. And so he was planning on doing that already. And so he had him in the high chair eating his eggs and he ended up getting sick. And at that point, I'm like calling the doctor. I was on my way home from that. And she's like, yeah, you need to bring him in because, you know, obviously he's, he's starting to vomit. His blood sugar was sky high. We changed the pot as soon as I got home, but then we took him to the ER and, you know, they hooked him up to fluids and did labs and he was definitely trending into DKA like hmm. at that point. I mean, like it wasn't full blown, but his labs. You of all people, you knew exactly what that looked like at that point. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. Like once he, once he got sick and then probably like a month ago, kind of a similar situation where it was like overnight and we fed him something that like the fat and protein definitely could have caused a rise and like we could have like missed a bolus, you know, like, cause he like on a snack or something like that kind of like coupled. And, you know, after a couple hours, like, I'm like, okay, you know, and I wasn't giving him like huge boluses cause I'm like, it's nighttime. I need to sleep. Like, I don't want to tank him either. Right. And so I was kind of like going like really conservative on it and, you know, like nothing was really happening. He kind of plateaued and same thing. Like I woke him up. I'm like, okay, he needs to drink something, kind of get this moving, see what happens. And he like took a couple of sips and then he ended up getting sick. And I checked his ketones and, Mm -hmm. you know, they were like moderate to large. And we had an actually a new endocrinologist on call. And he, he was like, you know, if you guys are comfortable, like don't rush to the ER. Like you can, you know, as long as his ketones, like he might be just nauseous from the ketones itself. Yeah. And, you know, if you can get him to keep down food or liquid and you know you obviously changed his pot already check his ketones again in two hours and you know they were they were better in two hours Mm. you know so his pod just like wasn't working it was occluded and it's just frustrating because you can't see that you know that it's occluded you know you have to wait to take it off and it's just like one of those things you don't want to waste you know i mean he's he's using small amounts of insulin obviously per day and it's like you don't want to waste a you know a, a pod waste you know extra insulin already. I, and have, I have a question. Like, how much insulin would is a correction at this point? Like, say say you see a two hundred blood sugar and you want it to be one hundred. How much insulin does that take to move? So a point oh five takes him about down about thirty points. So I would probably do a point one five and have to catch it with a cracker. Yeah. Or something like that. You can't test whether or not it's your cannula with an injection because you still. A, cool, a, right, a half exactly. a unit is still way too much insulin for him. Yeah, like yeah. his normal boluses, like a meal bolus, like his biggest meal bolus is probably like a 2.5 to 3, a point three, And that's like his biggest meal, like carb-heavy meal. Mm. And like a normal correction bolus for him is like a 0. 0.1, 0. 0.15, wow. 0. 0.2 still. Yeah, I mean, your best friend is going to be him gaining weight. Right, exactly. Yeah. And and he eats like amazing. Like he's such a good eater. He eats everything and you know, so I'm I'm really thankful for that. But yeah, so I mean, other than that, like things, you know, are good. He's so he's such a good boy. Like he's so like, you know, with pod changes and, you know, the Dexcom changes, like, you know, we were really against screen time whenever like early on, like before he was diagnosed and we were going to like you know, they say to wait and things like that. But like when we were in the hospital and you're trying to keep a nine month old in a hospital bed for 11 days, 
like we had the TV on the whole time, like in the background too, because he was like laying still in a bed for days and days. <laughs> Brianna, and days. all your hippie ideas are out the window now that you're yeah. now that you're in the. Sh- <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, so, God, look at the yeah. iPad. I don't care. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, and he's good. Like, you literally are like, here, here it is. Like, you can distract him. He literally, I'm like, lay on your belly. He takes it. He's watching his video. Mm-hmm. Whatever. He doesn't care. He he winces, and sometimes he'll grab for it. Like it hurts, but he's you know, like he'll move on after it. And I'm just like really, really thankful that. You know, that's the case because I know a lot. I think that if he was diagnosed at an older age, I think if there's any silver lining to obviously the age he was diagnosed, like this is his norm. It'll be his, you know, that's all he'll be that he remembers. I believe that. And at the same time, I don't want to freak you out, but Arden is working through a fairly significant needle phobia at 19 years old. Really? So, yeah. So um, it's it, it popped up on her when she was like, oh, gosh, like, I don't know, eight maybe even a little younger, like one day for a blood draw, she just like, she climbed the walls like Spider-Man in reverse. And it, it was never a problem up until then. She just had like a weird reaction. She didn't want her blood draw. Um, she's powered through it most of the time, but Arden, like the secret about Arden is, is that after she was four, when she got an Omnipod, Arden doesn't get injections like very infrequently, like maybe right. once once in a while, you're like, let me just inject some here to see if my the pump site's the problem. But that's just not a thing that comes up for us. So as a matter of fact, the first time I, in, I reintroduced the syringe was probably two years after she was on a pump. And when I pulled it out, she goes, what is that? She like didn't mm-hmm. even know. And now today, like modern time uh, right now, she's using Ozempic mm-hmm. to help her with insulin sensitivity and um, probably PCOS symptoms too. And, um, and so she has to inject it once a week and it has been, uh, quite a thing. Like she's done the last two on her own and I think she's got it now, but I mean like Kung Fu fighting hands, like as you're coming (laughs) at her, like she's like, you do it. I can't do it. And so you come at her and she'd be like, no, wait, wait. And as you reach, she'd reach out and push away. And I'm like, Arden, the needle's uncovered. She's like, I can't stop myself. Her hands were just like, they're just like, no, no, no. And uh, then she'd do it and, you know, didn't love it. But then she had to go back to college. So last week and the week before she's done it on her own. But the first time she did it, she videoed it. There's no way she'll ever let anybody see the video, but it's borderlines on hilarious and like you would never believe that somebody's had diabetes for this long was like i don't know if i can do this so yeah it's really crazy like how you know like like i did like i felt so comfortable and like you just kind of like go through this phase of like you know you didn't know it was coming like Mm -hmm. that you feel this way and just like that you know and i think about like whenever he'll get older like i see like moms you know dads in the group talk about like you know how their kid was completely fine. They were good. They accepted it. And then like, they kind of like hit these like bumps in the road where, you know, they don't want to have diabetes anymore and they wish they could be normal. And one mom said like, you know, her son was like, mommy, why are you hurting me? And like, you know, it's just like heartbreaking. Like you don't want to do this. And I think like that was when I said to Rob, like, what's, what's one of the things, like, if there's anything you want me to mention, you know, and that's like one of the things, like you have this like precious child and like you have to hurt them to, you know, save them basically, you know, and, and to take care of them. And it's just, you know, that's like one of the things that even though he's not as bothered by it, like it still affects him. Like he doesn't love it. He really doesn't like Dexcom. Yeah. I I know what you're saying. It's, It's really hard. Yeah. No, it's, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, I've over the years, like a number of things about once we found out that my, uh, when Arden was really young, she told our Kelly's sister, um, that she was excited for her birthday to come because she had wished for her diabetes to go away for her birthday. So she just had to make it to her birthday before it went away. Right. And that's the, that's the time I decided to share, right? Yeah. That was when she was really young. Um, she once, we were once discussing, um, a friend of a family whose child has uh, got a lot of like mental deficits. And she once told me, I'd rather be him than me. Her answer was because he can't die from his thing. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, you think about that and it's, you know, there's, I think you just said in one that I listened to the other day, like you can't think of another diagnosis where you literally like, if you forgot about it for a couple hours or like didn't do something like you could, yeah, you're in, you know. you're in a lot of trouble, right? It, yeah. That quickly. By the way, I think if you got her back here today and asked her, a, she wouldn't remember saying those things, and B, I don't think she'd feel that way anymore. So, right. you know, exactly. there, there is that too. There, listen, 
the best advice I can give you, I've raised two kids now, is that everything happening today that seems really, really important, most of it doesn't end up being. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And it's and it feels really heavy right now because obviously we are only a year and a half into the diagnosis and also, you know, just with him him being so young and just like a difficult baby. So one of the things prior to his diagnosis, he was waking up like 10 to 15 times a night and I was back to work and I was literally so sleep deprived. Like I remember saying to Rob, I'm like, I am going to die. Oh, I've had that feeling like in the middle of the night, you're like, this is it. I'm going to have a heart attack and my head's going to pop. Yeah. 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 yeah like I, I said, I am so tired. And like, I was trying not to keep track of how often he was waking up, but So like I would just nurse him back to sleep. And so like when we talked to the endocrinologist, they said like it probably was because his blood sugar was so high and his body kept telling him, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty because he was so high. Okay. And then he would nurse and then he'd be even higher. And it was just this cycle of constant, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry. And so like, you know, like looking back, it's like, okay, there was like a reason for that. And like I could never bring it, like I just not the person that can like do cry it out and things like that. And I'm glad that I didn't at this point. And I was at least like, like he couldn't help it. And like, he was actually going through like a medical condition as to like why he was waking up. So, Mm. you know, that's just like hard, but I'm glad that I know that there's likely the cause for that. Yeah. And I also think that too, um, just like one of the things that I wanted to say is like my mental health throughout all of this has like, like I said, I went through these stages of grief and I think that a lot of it, like the way that you react, I guess, like after the diagnosis, like I remember there was a post recently that got like a lot of attention. Somebody was like, basically like it could be worse kind of thing. And Mm -hmm. people were like, well, that doesn't feel that way to me. And this feels like the end all be all. And it's extremely heavy. And, you know, it was like a lot of back and forth. And like, I think that there's like a lot of things that like really play into how somebody bounces back things oh sure like some some people are just like so different and so i feel like it's really important for people to understand and that's why i really love like how the podcast has helped me like listen to certain people and their stories it's like almost like sitting in on somebody else's therapy session (laughs) yeah i know i feel like that all the time (laughs) so it's like okay yeah i feel that way okay somebody feels like that that i do and i'm not the only one that feels like this is like you know like end in my life for right now And, you know, like, I think that just some people are more resilient and like can deal with adversity a lot better than others and like can just like roll with it. Like, oh, this is our life now. Could be worse. I think that like personality types, like overthinkers, worriers, you know, people that are perfectionists that like want to have like complete control. I was used to like always like trying to be like at work and, you know, like a perfectionist. And, you know, I always had to have things certain way. And like, you know, obviously diabetes is not like that. So that was really hard to accept. Um, where some people are like, oh, he's high, correct and move on. You know, like I do double back a lot to the why, which I do it more for like a learning for the next time, yeah. not because I'm like obsessing over it, but like, I just don't want this to happen again. Well, you are still learning. And, and by the way, your, his scenario and your scenario are going to change drastically more frequently than people with older kids too. Like, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. We yeah. have to go through like all the cycles. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, oh no, not not I'm yes, but not just that. Like every time he puts five pounds on, everything's gonna change. Right, right, you know? true. Right. Yeah. So so then, you know, also too, I think about people that like, you know, their access to supplies, like, you know, I said earlier with like the, you know, technology and things like that. Um, you know, can they afford it? Do they have high deductibles? Like, you know, things like that. Um, will their doctor prescribe the technologies? And then, you know, like how much your life deviated from normal when diagnosis occurred. Like I read about some people like they're in the hospital and like for three days and then they go back and, you know, their kid has to go back to school the next week or something like that or two weeks. And, you know, like they're pretty much like back to mostly normal. Mm -hmm. One of the things, you know, since the DKA story was so long, like we actually on day three, while we were still in the hospital, um, Rob's family reached out to us and we're like, you guys need to move in with us. Like, you need to be able to focus on that boy and like take care of him wholly. And also like, I knew I was going to have to take time off of work and like the doctors like were expressing like, this is like serious, you know, obviously. And like, we don't know, like this is going to be completely trial and error. Obviously like I was breastfeeding and I was going to have to be out of work and like, we couldn't afford to keep our place. You know, we were in a rental for six years, actually. It was a place I absolutely loved. And you know, we just knew that we weren't going to be able to sustain that. 
and like have me be off of work. So we made the decision on day three to give our landlord notice, like, cause it was at the end of the month, it was the 29th when he was diagnosed that we were going to move out. We gave our 30 days notice and we actually ended up moving in with family that was about 45 minutes away. Mm. And we lived with them for nine months. And so, you know, I think that it was, I think it was really, really good for us. And then like sometimes though, like obviously like isolating because like we were just focused on diabetes yeah, and like what was going on, but like we really had to be, we were giving the Lovenox injections. We had our so many follow-ups. We also had to see a cardiologist because one of the things he was like profusely sweating too. And I think now, like it was mostly happening when he was nursing and I think his blood sugar was so high. Yeah. So thankfully, like everything was good there, but he had to have like an echocardiogram. Like it was just so much. Yeah. Trust me. I think, I think if you're not uh, at the top of a bell tower with a rifle, you're doing good. And so (laughs) yeah, seriously, like as long as you're holding and you seem, listen, don't cheat. Just look straight ahead and don't look at a clock. Do you know how long we've been talking? I know. Yeah. Like, like I feel like if I keep recording, you'll, you can keep talking and that it would be interesting. And I think that's a reflection of how much you've been through in such a short amount of time, but you also seem like you're doing well considering. Yeah. I think that we've gotten to a point, like we, we were there for nine months. We figured out like, you know, Rob was going to go back to work and that I was going to stay home with Kai back in June. We moved into the place we're at now. We're, you know, back on our own, which was like a huge shift because they, yeah, they were taking care of our meals, our grocery shopping, things like that. And, you know, again, so it's like just kind of getting back to that and having to meal plan and figuring out all the carbs for that and everything. But yeah, we're overall doing, you know, well. We you just really are. On, Brianna, we're just that, trying to focus on he's amazing. And yeah. he's, you know, here. That's what Rob always like emphasizes. Like he is here. He's, he almost wasn't. Yeah. No, you got, and listen, can you imagine? I got to tell you, like, I'm going to have you back on in like two years. Because you're you're gonna look back on this time and you're gonna be like, mm-hmm. oh my god, is that how it was? Because it's not gonna, it's just not gonna feel like that anymore. And right. and you don't know that now. I mean, and I can only tell you from having talked to so many people and seeing this happen over and over again. Um, obviously, you're you know nine months old is pretty young, but still, I've had enough of these conversations. You will listen back to this, I swear to you, in a couple of years and be like, oh my god, like I don't even recognize that existence anymore. Like you're not going to be like this forever. So just keep doing, yeah. keep doing what you're doing. Like pay attention, you know, be diligent, learn new stuff, shift when he shifts and you're going to be fine. And one day, listen, here, let me see if I can make you feel better. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to look at Arden's last bolus. Uh, it looks like she just put it in. Yeah. She just, she just had 20 carbs. Now Arden's insulin sensitivity has changed significantly because of Ozempic. Mm-hmm. But she just had 20 grams a snack. It was 2.6 units. Yeah. And since then, the algorithm has given her like another unit of insulin as her blood sugar started to go up. And her basil's jacked up right now to like 2.4 an hour because the algorithm's stopping a little bit of a spike. Point is, is that there will be a day that you'll be in a pizza place or something and you'll be like, all right, just use that 10 unit bolus. Let's go. And you're going to think back to this and be like, oh, my God. I don't recognize these two things as being the same person in the same life, but it's going to be. So, yeah, I feel really hopeful. Yeah. Um, I'm just amazed by the, like, just since he was diagnosed, how much technology has come out since then. Oh, and yeah. like a lot of like the trials and things like that, but like Omnipod 5's been released since then. And, you know, the Islet and, you know, multiple other G7 um, since then. Right. And yeah, 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 G7. More coming. Yeah. So there's like, I feel, I feel fortunate to be like, if he could be diagnosed at any time, like I'm thankful for it to be this time. And, you know, we definitely are super hopeful for the future, but still have to yeah, live through just, now. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to give hope to, you know, it's, uh, they told us, you know, it was less than 1% that are diagnosed under one. And so like speaking back all the way back to the beginning of our conversation, um, you know, about the rare things. And here we are with, you know, now my son having this, you know, rarity, like getting diagnosed under one of this, you know, it's just kind of crazy. But the one thing that like really helped too is there's, you know, seeing other really small children and, you know, like I remember like frantically in the hospital, like searching the search bar for like, seven months, eight months, nine months, 10 months old, you know, like trying to see like what came up, like the results, like 
how many, you know, like if, were there other any, or were there any other kids? What's the, I know my Facebook group is, ex- is uh, exceptional. I'm not, I, I'm, but, <laughs> but what's the best one for infants? Is it diapers and diabetes? Diapers and diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I mean, not, it's not, the good thing is, is they're like not really competition because it's not, it's literally just a group. I mean, I meant exceptional in, in the, in, because it's, it's got a specific, well, it's a specific pe- group of people and they all, Sunset. yeah, they all know. I mean, this is a, a niche of a niche of a niche of a niche, right? Like right. diapers and diabetes, but that's the, that's the group I hear about most often that people say is helpful. And I think that I found diapers and diabetes first, and then I found your group from there. Somebody recommended that, like when I was doing these searches, like I saw that in the comments and I actually have like a screenshot that says juice box podcast. And then like, I looked that up later. And that's when I found your group. And so like, it's just, you know, again, like even like the podcast is amazing, but I'm so thankful for like just the resource of the group that you have, like all of these like super seasoned diabetics and diabetic parents and caregivers that are like all together and they just like collaborate and like help people with their problems, whether it be like a mental health issue in that moment or, you know, a technology issue in that moment or how would people know to smack a Dexcom with a spoon to get it to release <laughs> when it's stuck? Back when G6 it, would get stuck when it first came out. I yes, remember that. Yeah. Yes. Like there's so there's like, it comes up a lot. Like, oh my gosh, my G6 is stuck. Like the, and like people are like, smack it with a spoon. Like, it's just so funny, but you would never know that. And it's all because like your group and, you know, just everything from the podcast. And I just, I, I'm super thankful that we well, you're that we found it. Thank you. I'm glad that it's helping you. I really am. I hope it uh, at my at my funeral somebody is going to say that guy made a really great Facebook group. I don't know. Even I'm stunned by how valuable it is for people. Like you know, I mean, because I've said it on here before. I, I'm happy to reiterate. I didn't want to do it. I got like mm-hmm. you know people that listen to the podcast were like, we need a place to talk about the podcast. And I was like, oh, I don't want to run a Facebook group. And then I did it. Now today, I mean, the last time I looked, it had forty five and a half thousand members. Right. It, it does like one hundred and twenty five new posts a day, eight thousand likes, comments, and hearts, and like just teeming with like you said, all spectrum of the rainbow. People who've had experience with type one, type two, lada gestational. Like there's so many people in there and they're very good at talking to each other. And even mm-hmm. the instances of are very few and far between. <laughs> and and we and I take care of them very quickly when they happen, actually. So that's very true. Yeah. And that's the thing too, is like it's cool because you know, I can see in the threads like you're responding to people and you know, it's just like it's important. It is. Yeah, and yeah. like so it's not like it's like this, you know, unattainable just a stagnant thing. thing. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I'm definitely in there because it's just I mean, I see it as I see it as for the value that it has. Like it, it is, it is providing something that healthcare can't provide. And and that's the thing is like yeah. people don't realize, and that's the most frustrating thing. And I just wanted to mention this. I know I've talked a lot. Yeah, no, you definitely um, have to get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry, <laughs> my wife is texting um, me like, "Hey, is everything okay?" And I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> but the fat and protein thing, like that, is just I cannot believe. And I just wonder how many people like are struggling all day long because they don't know. Yeah, because they don't know. And like, if I wouldn't have learned that through the group and the podcast, and like, you know, one of the threads that had like the um, fat protein calculator, like we use that all the time now because we have to. Like he he eats carbs. Like we definitely don't restrict anything per se. But like until he's a little older, where he can be like, yeah, I'm a hundred percent eating what's on my plate. Like we were you know, definitely modest with like not going way overboard that we would have to make up those carbs with something huge. So, you know, like his meals are probably like 30 carbs usually and really well-rounded meals, but like he eats a lot of protein and, you know, it's like we we notoriously get, you know, spikes two hours after a meal. Like if we didn't have that resource, like we would just be literally like helpless like we'd just be correcting all the time be like well well, I guess we missed a bolus and like we wouldn't know that it wasn't from like the carb count you know yeah and I think that that can actually be really dangerous because like how many people don't know that it's from the fat and protein and like they're like reaching out to endo to say like hey 
like they're going high after their meals and like say they missed the carb count and then it ran into the protein fat rise and they're like, oh, well, you just need to like increase your carb ratio. And then they're like tanking them every time. So yeah. it like doesn't really, you, you know spin what I'm out saying? Of control. Before, like, the- you don't know, you don't know what variables are impacting at that point and you're chasing ghosts and you don't know what you're doing and it creates like a turn, it's a tumble effect. And then yeah, before, like they're yeah. going low again before they like then start going up from the fat and protein. So it's just like if like I just feel like that should be something that's told. Like I know they're trying to give like the do not die advice and like not trying to overwhelm people, but just to say like, hey, and also mm-hmm. Good just luck. be aware. Good luck. <laughs> that, Listen, just that just, fat and protein can yeah. also turn to glucose after a certain amount of time and affect the blood sugar. Yeah. And you know, like we think like how early on, like we were doing super low carb, like when he was released. And Rob and I said to each other, like, how much of it like that we were having problems that he was staying so high was probably from these all like that. fat and protein rises. Yeah. Well, you're just in the so, very beginning of all this. It's so interesting to I hear know. you talk about it really. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, gonna, anyway, I'll stop talking. No, don't, don't, don't lie. I really appreciate you doing this and spending so much time. Obviously it's going to yeah. be a two part episode. And um, although if it was up to me, I'd put it out like this, I, but I'm a person who listens to three hour podcasts, but right. not everybody loves them. So um, anyway, <laughs> I really appreciate you doing this. I seriously would like you to stay in touch. And I really yeah, do think definitely. I'd like to have you back on in a couple of years. Like I know it seems like a long time, but I think there'd be a real valuable insight from this conversation to that one. Yeah. I think it will be interesting to see as time goes on. And like you said, the weight gain and like the Omnipod, obviously we plan on just staying on, you know, pods for a long time. It's really helped our control. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, not that we know what MDI is like, but you know, like it's, it's imperative for us, I think with its age, but it'll be just really interesting to see as he gains weight, like, do we still have those like drops and like, how long does that last? Mm -hmm. Like, how long do we have to battle that? You know? Right. Well, yeah, definitely. You're getting there. You're doing a great job. If somebody hasn't told you already, let me be the one to tell you, I think you guys are doing terrific and, um, just keep it up. And I'm, I'm so happy that the, uh, the group and the podcast have been valuable for you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this with me. All right. Well, thank you so much for today. And yeah, that's absolutely my pleasure. It's all I have to say. You could talk That's forever. That's all I have to say. I mean, Are you I out do. of your mind? <laughs> Two and a half hours ago, you're like, I'm a little nervous. And I was like, like an hour ago, I was like, what is she talking about? You're, you're not nervous for sure. <laughs> Hold on a second for me, okay? Okay. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast was sponsored by U.S. Med usmed.com slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. Get started today with US Med. Links in the show notes, links at juiceboxpodcast.com. If you'd like to wear the same insulin pump that Arden does, all you have to do is go to omnipod.com slash juice box. That's it. Head over now and get started today and you'll be wearing the same tubeless insulin pump that Arden has been wearing since she was four years old. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G-V-O-K-E-G-L-U-C-A-G-O-N dot com forward slash juice box. Hey, thanks for listening all the way to the end. I really appreciate your loyalty and listenership. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. Subscribing to the Juice Box Podcast newsletter is this easy. You type juiceboxpodcast.com into a browser, scroll to the bottom, put in your email address, click sign up. Hey kids, listen up. You've made it to the end of the podcast. You must have enjoyed it. You know what else you might enjoy? The private Facebook group for the Juice Box Podcast. I know you're thinking, oh, Facebook, Scott, please, but no. Beautiful group, wonderful people, a fantastic community. Juicebox Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes on Facebook. Of course, if you have Type 2 or you're touched by diabetes in any way, you're absolutely welcome. It's a private group, so you'll have to answer a couple of questions before you come in. We make sure you're not a bot or an evildoer, then you're on your way. You'll be part of the family. Hey, what's up, everybody? If you've noticed that the podcast sounds better, And you're thinking like, how does that happen? What you're hearing is Rob at Wrong Way Recording doing his magic to these files. So if you want him to do his magic to you, wrongwayrecording.com. You got a podcast? You want somebody to edit it? You want Rob. All right, kids, we're done. We're at the end. Just do me one last favor. If you can, if you could, please 
If you have the need or the desire for something that one of the sponsors is providing, please use my links or my offer codes. They help the show so much. And that means me. You're helping me to make this podcast every day. You're helping me to support the private Facebook group, do all the things that I'm doing. I'm not asking you to buy something you don't want or something you don't need. But if you're going to get one of these items, use my links or my offer codes. They help me a ton. Thank you so much for listening and for supporting. I really do genuinely appreciate it. I'll be back very soon with another episode.